Hello everyone, I'm Louis Bauer, Senior Director of Horticulture at Wave Hill. On behalf of Executive Director and President Karen Meyerhoff and the board, I would like to welcome you to our first virtual horticulture lecture. I'm in our conservatories filled with plants in bloom, wishing that I could give my usual invitation to come to the greenhouses to see them, but currently they're open only on a limited basis. We do post what's happening inside here on social media so that you have, have a glimpse of the flame vine and the freesias and the anemones that are all blooming. And of course, the gardens with their great views are open. First, I'd like to say thanks to a number of dedicated staff from several Wave Hill departments who have made this virtual talk a reality. And great thanks go to the Friends of Horticulture Committee with Chair Donna Raftery who hosts the series and the underwriters and sponsors you saw listed. They and you make these talks possible. Our speaker is Matthew Reese, and this is what Claire Foster wrote about him in 2017 for British House and Garden. Ambitious, talented, and above all, plant mad, Matthew Reese is one of a handful of top echelon gardeners working in Britain. Matt began his career in horticulture at the University of Liverpool's Nest Botanic Garden as an apprentice. He then went on to study and earn qualifications at Whistley and Kew. After three years at Kew, Matt lived and worked at Great Dixter in East Sussex as assistant head gardener, working with Christopher Lloyd and Fergus Garrett. It was here that paths crossed with Donna Raftery who suggested he speak for us tonight, so thanks Donna. Outside his work, Matt has traveled widely, looking at plants in the wild, and was part of an expedition to the Himalayas with the late renowned plant hunter, Michael Wickenden. In 2010, Matt became head gardener at Malverley's in Hampshire, where his efforts have gathered wide attention. Welcome, Matt. Hello, hello. Can everyone hear me? Hello. Welcome to uh, Mulvaly. Thanks so much, Louis, for that. It was, um, that was really nice. It was very flattering. Um, I'm not sure I deserve it all, but anyway. Uh, thank you for Wave Hill for, and Donna for inviting me to, to talk. Um, great. Just a, a caption, sir. Um, I'm going to flick on to the PowerPoint. This is all quite new for me and I think new for Wave Hill as well. So just bear with us uh, while we get these things up and running. Can you see? Uh, apologies. Share screen. It's, it's coming nearly there. So play from the branding. Here we go. This is Mulvalees. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's quite interesting, Mulvalees, uh, on, on, in many respects. Uh, um, it's uh, from a, I mean, I, I take it you're all sitting comfortably. Um, obviously, I can't see you. So this is a, um, a little bit uh, unusual, but amazing at the same time that I can be sitting in England. And uh, you can all be sitting in the States, uh, seeing what's going on. Um, so this is Mulvalees. It's a. Uh, it's. Uh, I've been here for about eleven years. The, I came when the current owner bought the property eleven years ago in fe February, almost exactly eleven years ago. Um, and we've become quite popular um, over that period of time, um, for, for a couple of reasons, really. I suppose um, we've built an English flower garden from scratch, which is a. Uh, uh, quite unusual for, 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 because most gardens nowadays tend to be in the continental stand uh, uh, style. And also um, I, I kind of designed the garden in conjunction with the owners. And it's very unusual to have the, the, the head gardener doing the design work as well, because a lot of the time um, they are hiring these big architects and things. I mean, obviously yeah, I've done a bit of design work and things like that at Kew and Wisley and at college and things. And I kind of knew what I wanted to do, um, but uh, it just took a, took a little bit of time. This is what Mulvalees has become quite uh, renowned 
for its uh, um, it's these uh, uh, mixed borders uh, that we've been putting together over the, the last 10 years. When we arrived, everything was very different. We didn't really have a garden uh, to, to create these, the, these uh, mixed, mixed borders. There was borders here, but they were much narrower. There weren't as many uh, and the planting was completely different. For me, what we wanted to do was create something that was kind of, you know, uh, you know, quite naturalistic in style, um, but kind of uh, similar to Dixter. It's influenced by V to Sackville West, uh, Sissinghurst, maybe William Robinson. Um, and this is this is what we've we've come up with. It's different from Dixter. Obviously, uh, I've taken uh, you know my own style on, um, but this is kind of uh, the sort of thing that we've that we've been doing. We use lots of self. Hello. Hi, Matt. This is Erica from Wave Hill. I have a couple of questions for you. Okay. What makes an English garden different from a European garden? And also, what makes a continental garden? Um, well, uh, this is something that I will go into in more detail. Um, but uh, basically, uh, continental style tends to be uh, quite heavy on grasses and uh, groups of perennials. It doesn't, it's not as, doesn't have as many shrubs in it. Uh, it, it it's not as high maintenance. Uh, it generally looks quite different because of the grasses. And, uh, and, and I mean, this is kind of, it, the continental style it, it, it is, is kind of, um, it, it, it is easy to do on paper. Um, whereas this style it, it is, uh, it's very difficult to do on paper because it's very intricate. It's very complex. There's lots of adding of plants and subtracting of plants along the way to, to, to get the desired effect, to keep the garden going through the seasons. And um, yeah, and, and I mean, regarding the, the European, there are European gardens that are similar to this, but this is, you know, this is just a, a you know, it's, it's a, a phrase that's coined from, from Robinson who, who um, uh, would hark back to nature and look at nature as influence uh, for, for his influence when he was creating uh, the garden and would kind of maybe exaggerate it uh, uh, and and this is how he would design his gardens it was very different different to what was going on uh, elsewhere in the gardening um, uh, elsewhere in gardens during um, you know the Victorian era when bedding was at its heyday so this is where this English flower garden phrase comes from I mean, just to set the scene, I mean, this is Mulvleys. Uh, the house decks back to the 1870s. It's a Georgian style house. Um, it's, it's not listed. It's uh, a beautiful house, uh, but you know, uh, it's, it's not a, a anything particularly special. We're about a, an hour south of, of Oxford, not far from uh, Highclere Castle, uh, about five miles away, Highclere being famous for, for Downton Abbey, among other things. Um, and this is an idea of, the, of, of, of what we've been up to, these, the, these borders. Um, I mean, when the, the, the boss came to, to, to Mulvleys, obviously the, the, this didn't, didn't exist. Um, he was kind of champing at the bit to get stuck into the garden to, 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 to make his mark. And he was you know, hungry for ideas and you know, wanted to push on. But we agreed quite quickly to, to sit on the garden for a year to get to know it. This is one of the most important things, I think, particularly when you've got a big space you know, and you maybe you've got you haven't got any limiting factors. You've got maybe a bit of quite a lot of cash, and there's nothing to hold you back. It, it can be very dangerous sometimes to just jump in there, and sometimes those initial moments of inspiration can be a bit, a bit dubious, and you kind of need to consolidate your thoughts, um, get to know the space as well, get to know what's in it. For example, uh, where the prevailing weather comes from. You know what the soil's like. Uh, you know, do you have spring bulbs? You know orchids in the lawn, whatever. Um, decide what you want, you know, out of the garden. Uh, you know, the, they quite quickly decided they wanted a vegetable garden and almost as quickly decided they really didn't want the putting green that was next to the, to the house or the, the, the football pitch or soccer pitch, as you would call it. And one of the things that we did quite a lot was to go and visit other gardens because it was important for me to, to kind of understand what they, exactly what they wanted. Um, so we went to various gardens all over the, the country, Sessinghurst, Pashley Manor, Rousham, uh, you know, Hidcutt. I even uh, suggested we went to Nympha in Rome, and so we ended up going out there, which was quite nice. Um, yeah, I did mention Japan, but he kind of said, no, nah, he kind of caught on to what I was about then. But Dixter was a, a garden I took him to, and he fell in love with it. Um, 
uh, he loved the atmosphere. Uh, he loved the, uh, the rhythm in the garden with the, the topiary and the hedging. Uh, he loved the plants. He just uh, uh, loved, loved the planting and the composition, the way the, the, the garden felt as you moved around it. So this became uh, the blueprint for, 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 for Mulvilles in many respects. Um, and it was quite handy as, as you've, as Louis alluded to, I know Dixter quite well. And it was when I was a student at Wisley in 97, I first went to Dixter to seek to work in the gardens for a weekend um, and fell in love with the place and remained a friend of Christo uh, uh, until I started working there. Um, and those six years I was at Dixter was some of the best, you know, in my life. I, you know, Q and Wisley were brilliant for learning about plants and uh, teaching you horticulture. But what Christo did, he, he taught you how to, to put plants together and what you could really do with uh, uh, all of these different perennials and in a flower garden. And it was more about the artistic side, but it was also a plantsman as well. Um, and so it was just a, a, an amazing experience. And this is what I wanted to, to, in, to do at, uh, at Mulvilles. So back to Mulvilles. Uh, uh, we had a look at the garden and after a year we decided the first thing that, that, that or the family the first thing they wanted was a vegetable garden and if we jumped in straight away at the start and got stuck in um, we would have kind of maybe put the vegetable garden in the wrong place uh, we had a wall garden and it had already been redesigned by the previous owner uh, with uh, Tom Stewart Smith but it just didn't cut it for the for, 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 for the for the family and they decided this was probably the best place and I agreed with them this event this was a wall garden that was built as a kitchen garden and if we'd put the vegetable garden elsewhere it just wouldn't have felt right this is where it belonged so we decided to get in here and dig up some of uh, Tom's planting they were lovely and wonderful but they just weren't wasn't what I was about I was kind of more you know like more intense planting there was quite a lot of repetition uh, we decided that we didn't like these big arches they were kind of a bit too dominant and behind there is where we decided that we wanted to to build this vegetable garden also behind those arches were a load of utopery and one of the things that Christo always said to me is kind of you know start with what you know works you know uh and, and build on from that you know one of the things that i enjoyed and i knew that worked that i really liked at uh, dixter was the the topiary lawn there's this lovely contrast between the sort of flowing mixture of the wildflowers versus that solid static strong forms of the topiary and I just thought it was a, a really really simple but really really striking so we decided to dig up the topiary that was in the way of the vegetable garden and uh, cart them all out of the uh, um, um, uh, the wall garden and make our own topiary meadow and you see this is Lawrence uh, he's a kind of counterweight so the the you didn't didn't fall off. It's not strict health and safety, but anyway, we managed to get away without maiming too many gardeners. So we so we positioned them on this what was otherwise a flat lawn with nothing on it, uh, in quite a formal uh, pattern. We uh, the the boss also decided he wanted uh, some chicken, so we built this uh, got this chicken house built, uh, and this became the focal point to this particular garden. There was also perennials in the way of the vegetable garden. So we dug up lots of these, saved them, and then we planted them in and around the, uh, uh, the utopiary. You can see here, camassias and things. We also planted various geraniums, Mrs. Kendall Clark, Veronicastrums and that sort of thing. And then we oversowed with wildflowers and it looked, uh, uh, you know, it looked uh, fantastic. You had this meaty mixture of wildflowers versus those, that strong static form of, 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 of the topiary. The problem we had was that the soil was quite, um, quite fertile, quite rich. And this is the ebb and flow of a new garden. You know, this is only three years old. Um, all of the utopery that we moved survived, but the, the knapweed started to become dominant to the point it was a mono planting and it was too aggressive. It looked heavy and it had lost that, that, that floaty meadiness. So we decided to, 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 to get rid of it. We were fighting a losing battle with this kind of really rich soil. You know, lots of people said, oh, we'll just dig in, dig out the topsoil and bring in some, but we much prefer to keep our soils and to, and to work with nature. And so we decided to get rid of what we had here and to, to, to sow an annual mix instead that we would, you know, uh, cultivate every year. And so this is a, as what we have now. It's a, um, it's a corn field mix. Uh, so these are annuals. So they regenerate from seed every year. Um, and it's a lovely effect and it goes on and it's, you know, starts with poppies and then we have corn flowers and corn cockles and various other things that come and go and it changes, you know, year on year, but it is a, a stunning effect. 
And this is the way it is today. One of the things that I decided as well is that I wanted to it look at, towards the end of the season, those wildflowers as they were starting to set seed could start to look a bit shabby and they start to fall over the path. And I wanted to tighten it up a bit. So I decided to frame it and put in a hedge. And the hedge is actually uh, uh, inspired by a hedge in New York Botanics. Many moons ago when I was at uh, Wisley, uh, when I left, I went up to New York Botanics uh, in, in the autumn to, to visit a friend and also went to Wave Hill, by the way, um, and saw the Palisades and, and uh, it was a beautiful garden. Um, but there was this hedge, I think it had salvia leucantha planted in front of it and it's Euonymus elatus compactus. And I was completely struck by the, uh, the, the autumn color. It was completely vivid. Uh, and, and, and completely amazing. It's almost too much. Uh, and so this is what we, we planted around the, uh, the topiary just to keep it tidy going through the, the seasons. And this is what it does in the autumn. On the money every year, you'll get this bright red autumn color. It's almost like it's a little bit too much. I mean, it's fine just for the autumn, but you wouldn't want to live with it right the way through the season. But it is a, a, a wonderful thing. And do you know what really sets it off? And if you're going to, this is kind of, if you're going to have a, a garden with lots of autumn color, make sure you have some evergreens. They're the, a wonderful foil for, 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 uh, uh, for autumn color. You know, and when you get the sunlight shining through the leaves, it really lifts the garden, particularly uh, get going, going into the autumn. And incidentally, uh, the Euonymus elatus actually cuts quite well and holds its leaves. And so it's, uh, we use it on the, uh, uh, the dining room table in little, uh, uh, little vases for, for shoots and things. So taking a few steps back, we're going back into the vegetable garden. Uh, we decided we wanted to dig all the perennials. This whole space that we're working on became uh, the vegetable garden. Uh, and um, these hoops as well that were, were quite dominant. This is where they finished. So they finished kind of, this is the spine, if you like, of the wall garden. And the way they finished so abruptly halfway down and the size of them, they just felt uncomfortable in that space. So this is something else we, we got rid of, hooked them out with, with diggers. We kept them and, and planted them elsewhere. So we planted in, in uh, a, a, a laburnum much, which we'll look at in a, in a minute. Um, the borders for, for the, uh, um, the spaces for the vegetable garden, we kept quite big. I, didn't, I want them to be practical. I wanted them to grow vegetables. I wanted them to feed the house. I didn't want them to be too fussy. Uh, the ornament would come with the vegetables in there. The hedges, once they were, they were grown, would, it would start to tie everything together. We also decided we wanted some fruit trees, so we decided to, 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 to build some fruit cages. This is a house called West Green, not far away. Um, and I love the, the shape of this. And the thing about fruit cages, a lot of the time, they tend to center stage in, in, uh, in vegetable gardens, but they're often, if they're big, they're ugly. And if they're they're small and pretty, they're impractical. So we wanted to make something like this that was big and beautiful um, in, in, in the vegetable garden at Mulvilles. And this is what we designed. Um, and you can see this is the hedges after. We like them so much, we put two in. Um, and inside there, there's a pair of sweet, uh, a cherry in each and then underplanted with, with, um, uh, with currants, which are underplanted with strawberries. It's a high maintenance vegetable garden. So, you know, we're always kind of doing succession sow-ins and kind of harvesting and nothing's wasted. It goes into the main house. And then if they're not around, we, we send it up to London. And then if they're not in London, we eat it ourselves. And sometimes we sell it. Uh, last year, we sold quite a lot because of the, uh, um, the you know, the, the COVID epidemic. Um, pandemic, we, we, we sold a lot and, and raised money for the school. So people that were passing by could put money in an honesty box and take various things uh, away with them. It's always fun to grow different varieties as well. And this is something we're experimenting more and more, trying to see which varieties are good for salads, good for roasting, good for pickling and that sort of thing. Just keep food lively and interesting. And it's just interesting for the guys as well. And so this is some of the beetroots that, that, that we grew uh, uh, last year. Another thing that we do, uh, and it's really important, it's really part of an English flower garden, is cut flowers, bringing their garden into the house. It, it forces you to look at plants in a different way. And sometimes, you know, you, you'll come up with combinations that in the house that you'll then take back into the garden. So, so it's, it's, it's a really useful way of, of dealing with things. And I really enjoy uh, um, bringing the garden into, into the house. And it's a, it's a real celebration of, 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 of the flowers and the plants. Um, and we often do it for special events or even just for 
you know, when the family are down for a weekend. And this is all from the garden, you know. And again, this is autumn colour with dahlias. So we're pushing the boundaries here. And this is another overmantel. Or just, you know, various bits and pieces from the garden just shoved in together. Well, not shoved in together, but gently placed together. Um, it's just a really nice thing to do. So this is the spine of the garden. This was quite an important part of the wall garden. And like I say, those beech hoops, they were just a bit big for me. They finished halfway down. So we wanted to do something that ran the whole, whole length of this, this particular path. And it created kind of like, a, this is where you could access all parts of the garden. Um, and so we created this uh, laburnum arch. We built this, or got, I got this iron frame uh, built. I wanted to keep the frame very simple because I wanted the laburnum uh, to, do the, to do the work. And this is after a couple of years, it's kind of, um, it's, it's doing its thing and it's designed to, to hang down these long racemes of yellow flowers that's, that's a, a really sweetly scented and then we planted some alliums underneath and now they started to link hands and this is what it's really about um, and if you go in the arch at that time of year the, the, the bees are really kind of deafening it's kind of just humming with them it's, it's really really beautiful and the scent as well is, is very special it's a one hit wonder but it, it, it's worth it, it, it it's, it's such a a spectacular site. And then I could say, this is where we access the, the white garden, the vegetable garden, um, uh, and it's uh, really, really serves a, a nice purpose. And you see this, this, what I've just been showing you is it was incredibly important for the rest of what we did, because it kind of, it gave the boss confidence in what I could do. Uh, it gave me more confidence in what I could do. And so we decided to, to tackle the rest of the garden I mean, the thing about Mulvilles is uh, the house and the wall garden were quite separate. So one of the things that we desperately wanted to do was connect the two. We wanted to make the house sit more comfortably in the garden. Um, so we decided to, and this, this area that, that was between the two was a big football pitch. Um, and he just really didn't want that in the garden. This is another overview picture that was taken by Claire Takas from, from a drone. But what I can demonstrate here is, I mean, when we first arrived, these were the, where the borders finished. They were too shallow. It's really important when you're building borders or when you're making gardens to give yourself enough depth so you can, you know, you can have the different layers so you can get that kind of uh, the compositions right. Otherwise, they'll lie, you know, if your borders are too narrow, things start to line up like soldiers. Also, you want to leave enough room to get shrubs in. I mean, you want the bones of the gardens to, to have space, um, you know, because, you know, you look at the long border at Great Dixter, and that's 60%, 70% shrubs. And then you have all of the other things working in between, you know, so you need to leave. So we extended the border and made it almost twice as wide. One of the other things that we did as well, um, which was quite important, was to, to, to add this kind of uh, uh, stone uh, um, uh, uh, paving in front of the border. Um, and that was kind of really important. It just allowed the plants a little bit more room so they could stretch their legs and kind of didn't look too hemmed in. It's horrible when you see these borders and everything's kind of staked to, with an inch of its life so it doesn't damage the grass. It's much better to put some stone in front of it and just let them sort of look natural. And one of the most important things about this is well, it kind of serves to bind this area of the garden in with the house. It frames it and makes it look more settled and more considered. Um, you know, I mean, it's incredibly important. It was quite uh, dramatic, the effect this had when we put on it. So this is kind of the area that I'm talking, the wall gardens over here. This is the football pitch. This is a putting green and this is the ha-ha in the house. So basically we wanted to connect this area, uh, uh, you know, the, the house um, with, with, the, uh, with the wall garden. And this is just kind of an overview. You can see the house. This was the football pitch. We had quite a lot of trees, many of them from uh, uh, the west coast of the US, um, you know, uh, Pinus radiata, various sort of uh, uh, redwoods and uh, pseudosugas. That, one of the first things after the, um, the wall garden that we set to work on was, was with the paths. Um, you can see they kind of finished quite abruptly. And one of the things that we decided quite quickly is that we wanted some more we wanted more drama. We wanted these dramatic views. And so we kind of started working with various vistas and things to kind of capture various things and to pull the garden together, if you like, and pull the house to, in, 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 into the garden. The paving was a bit boring and these grassy areas really didn't work. 
Um, so we decided to get rid of them. This is kind of initially when we arrived, there were some big lavenders here that were quite blocky and bulky. So we ripped them out and then we added these uh, annuals in just until we decided exactly what we wanted to do. These bits of grass as well, they kind of didn't work. So we got rid of those. And also we didn't like the way that this kind of stopped. We wanted to open that so that the kind of, you know, the, the, you had more interaction with the view beyond. So you kind of, your eyes could, didn't stop there. They continued forward. So we moved the steps from which were around the corner, which were over here to here. We wanted it to fit in and look natural. So we saved a lot of the bricks and the materials and we kind of tried to garden uh, and build in, in, the, in the, uh, the existing uh, uh, vernacular. Um, and here we set to on, on the path. The boss quite liked the path at Highgrove, this kind of cobble sort of checkerboardy kind of effect, uh, the time walk. So we did something, a take on that, if you like. Um, this is where the path used to finish. So we pulled it out forward, we dropped the ground. Uh, we just, we extended it and made it longer and it just makes it more dramatic. And by using these big, deep, old cobbles, it meant that we could allow plants to self-sow and colonize and get that sort of naturalistic effect that we were looking for. So the time, you know, we started putting soil in the cobbles. The cobbles were set in stone, in, 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 uh, in mortar or cement, but it was recessed so we could get soil in as well. And you can see how the time, the erigeron and things started to colonize. The crocus, they kind of, they, they, they love it because it's, you know, the, the stones heat up in the, in the summer and they quite like that sort of thing. It's kind of similar to the Mediterranean where, where a lot of them grow. And we started getting lipness and things, uh, um, self-sowing. The grass areas went, went by the way and we started and we planted up thyme. So we'd put a lot of the things that we were hoping would self-sow into the cracks in, in these areas. The soil was absolutely terrible here. It was really stony, kind of quite clay um, and just difficult to work. So instead of kind of ripping it all out, we decided to introduce plants that we thought would work well. And one of the things we, we, we hoped would work was this diorama, the angel's fishing rods. And we put it in and it didn't, it, 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 uh, it went off seeding all over the place. Yeah, it did phenomenally well. Also a lot of Mediterranean plants seem to like the soil as well. Uh, and this is a, a quite a, an interesting uh, flomus. This is uh, 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 the golden drancery, uh, flomus leucofracta. And so this is what we ended up with. You've got the seamless transition between the paving uh, and the garden where the cell sowers start to colonize. And it's kind of, uh, it's, it's quite dramatic and it's, it, it really has such a wonderful atmosphere. Um, and this is, you know, uh, uh, things like proboscums as well, cell sowing. And it happened quite quickly. This is in the space of, of four years. We've gone from something that was quite pedestrian to something that's re re really quite, quite, quite uh, beautiful and, and, and remarkable. So this is what we had, uh, and you can see the paths don't go anywhere to something like this. And looking in the other direction, if you notice this pillar, this is a putting green here, and this is what we've got. This is the pillar that I was saying, noticing, uh, and where the putting green was, we have this mixed border, um, which is far better than golf, um, in my mind, anyway. And again, some um, before and afters. This is looking from the roof of the house. This is the putting green. Um, one of the things we decided as well, that the lawn was a little small, given the proportions of the house. It was a bit pinched here and we didn't like this kind of organic shape. So we decided to push the ha-ha out. For those of you who don't know, a ha-ha is basically a ditch with a fence sunk in so you can't see it. So you've got the seamless view across the lawn onto the pasture beyond. And this is the, the tree. We pushed the ha-ha out from here. We straightened everything up. The ha-ha now runs parallel with the house and it meant that for all of this, which is, what, which is what we're going to be looking at next, just made it much easier to, 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 to work out. So again, these we're looking at the, uh, uh, the, the plan, um, the surveys before, before and after. Um, this, is, uh, this is the tree that ended up coming into the garden. Um, uh, here it is now. And so this is the space. So what we decided to do was to use quite strong vistas uh, and divide the space up into various rooms. It's kind of the natural thing, I think, when you, you, you have a big space to, 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 to divide it up into smaller rooms, it makes it easier to deal with. Um, and one of the things Krista would say, when you're going to design a garden, um, one of the things you, you have to decide is whether you want to keep your views or go for shelter. I mean, 
on the terrace, we have these wonderful views out across the, 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 the rolling English countryside, uh, and they really are beautiful. But at this time of year, uh, when the beast from the east rolls in, it, it comes with teeth and it comes shooting across that, that, uh, uh, that landscape and really hits the house full on. Whereas everything in here is much protected by, by the yew hedging. Also by dividing the, the garden up into rooms, it kind of means you can kind of create different atmospheres in the rooms, you can have a bit of fun. Um, and you know, uh, the owners of the house, they both have different tastes. She likes kind of the cooler colors, whereas he likes the hotter colors. So they've each got, got their own space. Um, but it just, you know, creates a, a nice atmosphere. We also added these, um, uh, these corridors. So, you know, between the rooms. I love the idea of going through these quite tight spaces into these big spaces, you know, uh, playing with the atmosphere and the pace as you move around the garden is, is, is quite, a, quite, a, quite important. And this is one of the first gardens that, that, that we built in this particular, this whole space was done in one hit, but this is where we started first and we worked away from the house. And this is the cool garden. The thing I'd like to point out about the cool garden is, is these big deep borders and, and, and the symmetry here. Uh, it's really important, I've mentioned it before and I'll say it again, to, to have, you know, give, your, give yourself space. You know, you want to have trees and shrubs because they will give you that height, the solidity, uh, which is particularly important early on in the year when the garden can be quite flat to work in or the perennials around just makes a uh, uh, makes it more dramatic uh, uh, and much more, more 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 interesting also you know it's nice if everything lines up um, when you're designing a garden but ultimately you know you'll find a lot of the time there are trees or buildings that are already existing that force your hand so everything can't like line, line up and be symmetrical and if you look at this bed, it's much bigger than this bed. This bed is actually quite small and completely different to these two. These two are symmetrical, but it doesn't matter because you rarely will you view a garden from above like this. And if you go to Dixton, you look at the gardens there, although they feel comfortable and they fit together quite well, hardly any of them are symmetrical. So it, it, it really doesn't matter. And it's, you know, uh, uh, if, if things line up all, all of the time. And this is the garden after a couple of years. We bought in a big shrub, a few big shrubs to, to add some, the boss wanted a bit of instant uh, impact, but you know, this is it taken uh, um, last year. It's really lovely to see these pictures after the, the weather we've been having recently because it's been just nonstop rain. Um, and it's nice to remember the garden when you know, it was uh, in, in, in sunshine and looking nice. Um, a lot of uh, um, the, the paving was uh, uh, reclaimed. The bricks are, are 17th century, very narrow bricks that I got from a place near Birmingham. And the bowl is an old fromagerie that I managed to find in a, um, in a local auction house. Uh, and it just forms a nice, a nice centerpiece. The, the plant in there is Stratoides aloides. It's kind of a, 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 a it's called water soldier and it sinks down in the winter, hides on the bottom and then floats up in the, in the summer. And you can see all the shrubs, you know, they really do bring that kind of drama. And then we work in the perennials in amongst them and the annuals and things like that. And we throw roses over the shrubs and that, and it, it just creates a, a sense of, 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 of drama. And one of the things when you go into a garden, you kind of, it's nice if the garden kind of consumes you slightly, you know, and you're consumed by the garden and you kind of, you're almost pushing your way through. You want to, it's nice when people interact with the garden, um, and to get lost in it. It's about atmosphere, it's about joy and pleasure, you know? Uh, and, and this is one of the things that we, we really want to, 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 to have this, this wonderful atmosphere and when we're painting with these, the, these plants. So the yew hedging is something that's quite important in this particular design. We use the, the yew hedging to, uh, to divide the, the space up into, into, different, into different rooms. It's, it's a wonderful dark canvas on which to paint your plants against, but it can be tricky. And one of the things that we did uh, when we bought these semi-mature ewes was we put French drains under them. It's really important when they're establishing that they don't sit waterlogged. If you're going to spend all this money on semi-matures, uh, it's, it's, it's worth spending a bit of extra money and making sure that they don't sit wet. Naturally, you in the UK growing chalky uh, uh, downland where it's very free draining. And so... Um, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's important to make. I mean, if there's anything that will kill you, it's waterlogging. You can see this is uh, uh, um, the, the drainage that we put in. Uh, we added a woodland garden. Um, 
you can see these are the paths. The paths are, we could try to keep them fairly narrow so two people could walk abreast. This is one of the things, again, that we inherited. A lot of the paths around the garden were roads and they were very big and you could drive down them. I don't like having roads in a garden. It should be an intimate space. Um, and this was actually quite a difficult path to, to, to design and make flow. Um, so it took a little bit of working out because there was plants that we wanted to keep. There was some existing azaleas, rhododendron, lutein hybrids and, and, and such like. So we want, we had to work around them. Uh, and we use this kind of York paving. The, pa the York stone, for, uh, uh, um, incidentally, was all uh, bought from Halifax. Um, it's one of those things that uh, is, is really good for making uh, uh, paths and uh, has a wonderful atmosphere. It's all, you know, it's kind of quite mellow and, and gentle and fits in. I didn't want to point it up because I kind of like the pattern it made. Also, it drains better as well, so it doesn't get as slippy. Uh, this is actually new York stone. York stone is a sandstone. Uh, and, it, you know, to get the right height for the treads, they all had to be cut fresh. Um, each one of these is 150 millimeters high by 300 deep. And you can take one of these wheelbarrows up and down without catching the, the edges of the stone. Um, uh, and this, this is our, oh gosh, this is the woodland garden uh, that we created in this particular space. Uh, the thing about woodland gardens for me, I, I kind of like it if they have a, um, you know, a more restrained kind of color scheme and things. There's not too many vibrant colors in here, lots of hydrangeas and things. These are all under planted with uh, uh, Galanthus, Paris, uh, trilliums, aracemas, all of that sort of thing. Off the side of the woodland, we had these, uh, this pseudosuga and, and a bit of woodland. And it's quite a big kind of border, nothing really happened in it. So we decided to put a small path through there to just bring it into the garden a bit. And one of the things I like to do, uh, and I think it's fairly important to do, is not to have too many different materials when you're designing a garden. The materials become, create continuity in the design. The hedging, the U hedging and the York paving creates that continuous thread through the garden. Uh, here, we used all the offcuts uh, to edge this particular path. This particular path was all dug by hand so that we didn't damage any of the tree roots. And then we put gravel down. And the idea um, was to create a sort of stumpery, which was kind of inspired slightly by my time uh, in in, uh, in India with uh, the late Michael Wickenden, a, a dear friend. Um, this is, uh, we just came over a pass and one of the things that we found quite a lot in this particular area were these kind of, oops, sorry, were these wonderful ridges covered by trees, junipers and, and, and uh, aces and things like that. But they all were covered in this kind of super incumbents uh, of moss it had this wonderful atmosphere i loved it kind of this uh, sort of elf in woodland you see michael there uh, this is ace awardii country you see this rhododendrons popping up absolutely amazing just over there is burma uh, or Myanmar. so we decided to create a stumpery and try and get the moss and the ferns growing on top and and getting this trying to create replicate this sort of atmosphere so we harvested all these old stumps that were lying around in hedgerows and in some of the woodland that we owned. We put them together to make this kind of, it's kind of a Victorian notion. There's one at Highgrove. It's just a bit of fun, you know. We started planting it up with ferns, the laginella. We put in an irrigation system, you know, and soon on, uh, quite quickly, the, uh, the ferns started to, to, to sell stone. It, it, it started to, 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 to work. You, this is, a, again, one of those before and after, but it kind of demonstrates what we were about. And this is uh, me on there and just kind of wondering how long he will hold that heavy piece of wood before he puts it down. Um, but you can see this piece of wood. And this was taken last year. You see, this is what we've got now. The most amazing thing about this is it's very, very low maintenance. We hardly have to do any weeding here. We have to tidy it up in the winter, spring, and then it just looks after itself. We keep an eye on the irrigation and, and that's about it. The ferns are self-sowing. The moss is starting to build up here and there. And it's just a, it's just a place with a really, really wonderful atmosphere. So moving on, uh, this is uh, one of the main axes in the, in the garden. Um, and this is another thing that I think uh, uh, that I did quite a lot. Uh, it's more reassurance, but I think a, a lot of landscaper, landscapers should, should, should spend more time on the garden, um, you know, in the space that they're designing. I mean, I did everything on a plan. We worked out the levels and all of that, but I also set everything out before we got stuck in or before the contractor started digging things up. 
I wanted to make sure that we got it right. And occasionally I'd move things to one side. So I knew exactly what was in the view. And again, here, looking in the other direction of the chicken house, we worked off this axis. I wanted to capture things and bring them together in these views so that everything sat comfortably. And so this is, you know, th these are the trees at the back and, you know, these are the trees at the back. You can see this is the, the axis. Also, each room is on its own level. So when you go from one room to the next, you go either up or down a level. It just feels more comfortable rather than having too many slopes. I much prefer steps. It creates more, more, more drama. It's more interesting. And it's just more comfortable to walk on a flat surface. And so this is that space. You'll notice these, again, are quite deep borders. The U hedging. Uh, one of the things about U hedging is in the first couple of years, it will start to look a bit tired and then it will recover. Uh, and this is the garden that was taken last year. It's, you know, this is about eight years old. You can see the shrubs are filled out, the perennials are filled out. It's got this wonderful atmosphere. The proportions of this garden, uh, I'm really, really happy with. The, the lawns, it's a nice size, but it's not overbearing and it definitely works in proportions uh, uh, with, 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 this, with the space. Uh, so then we went on a, a bit further. Um, and at the lowest point of this particular axis, we built a, a, a sort of pond room, if you like. We put this big pond in, and that, that was the design to capture reflections of the, the surrounding trees and countryside and to bring them into, into the garden. Um, and the thing with garden, when you design a garden to start with is that it can all look quite new and a bit heavy and a bit cumbersome and just uh, a bit awkward. And it's when the plants start growing that it starts, and starts to soften and starts to find its feet and it will come together. And again, this is still quite new, still waiting for the plants to grow, um, but they do. And before you know it, you know, it starts to, to come together. You see how we've got, you know, some really nice reflections going on. Um, and the idea is that eventually this weeping willow will reach out over the path and dip its limbs into the pool and it will all start to, to come together. And this is the sort of atmosphere that I'm after, something that's kind of, uh, just wonderful and verdant and exciting. There's fish in the pool. And there's this wonderful Stratoides alanoides again. This is a, a something I actually got from Dixter from the, uh, uh, the, the Sunk Garden Pond. Uh, and one of the great things about it is uh, it, it, it keeps the water very, very sweet and clear. Uh, it kind of oxygenates it and, and you know, you, you can see, see, to the, see to the bottom. Also, it's quite a nice contrast to the lily pads, the way it punches up. Uh, compared to the, to the flat plaids. But you can see, look, this is looking towards the chicken house. That chicken house is very much part of the garden. Now we've caught that in the view on this very strong access. Also, we've captured the trees as well. Everything that was just stranded in this kind of grassy football pitch is now part of a quite an exciting, exciting garden. And this is not such an exciting picture, but you get the impression these are more trees at the end. This is where the pond is. And again, we've kind of harnessed everything. We've brought it together in, in, in the garden. So this is that axis, but also we had another axis running at right angles. And this is uh, uh, what we put in it. This is uh, a garden again with a, a completely different feeling to it. This is a much, much, the most restrained planting. We only really have these cherries and some roses on the walls and a few cells sowing centranthus. It all revolves around this central, central rill. The prunus is uh, Shirafugan uh, or Fugenzu. Uh, it was introduced about 1910 by Ernest Wilson, and it's a wonderful cherry. Um, and again, this is kind of something that uh, I, I remember Christo uh, talking about, and I've seen him writing about it. And one of the things he picks out are these very long pedicels. You see how far you know, the, the, the flowers, they hang quite far from the branches. And then you have this coppery foliage above. So you almost have this two tiered effect. The foliage acts as a wonderful foil to the, uh, uh, to, to the pink flowers. It's quite late. And when the flowers finish, they shatter. So you get this lovely confetti effect beneath. It's really, really quite, quite beautiful. And it also has, well, you'll see a uh, very, very good autumn color. The rail. Uh, was was a kind of cantilevered construction. One of the things that I wanted to do, I mean, I remember I spent a little bit of time in Japan and one of the things I loved the way they kind of would manipulate water to capture the sound of it. So I wanted to make this kind of, uh, uh, the series of, of fountains uh, and capture the noise of them falling into the water. So we designed this cantilevered construction. So you have like these, this sort of chamber under here that kind of resonates and uh, and and bounces out the sound of that that water falling. 
The walls themselves are kind of uh, a little bit more ornate than everything else. They're kind of, this is York stone on the top that's hand carved. And then underneath it's a, a Farmington um, uh, dry stone effect wall. And then on the walls, we kind of planted roses and, and things. This is when it first started. And again, it looks quite barren. The hedges are much higher now. We're arching the hedges over the top. So really enclosing this space. We also decided on a, a sculpture uh, for, for, for the center. We were just working out which one or what we wanted to do. Uh, so that's just a paper model, uh, working things out. These are some of the roses, you know, um, that's the Eden Rose and uh, City of York and things like that. And again, they're starting to find their feet. Roses sometimes will sit for a couple of years before they really get going. Um, but when they do, and it's, sometimes it's about finding roses that like, what, you know, what, what you're up to, but uh, uh, they seem to be working out quite well. So this is a, a sculpture that we put at the end of that particular uh, vista, at the end of the rill. This is Neptune calming the waves um, and built by a guy called Stephen Pettifer, who has a company called Code Stone. Uh, really cool and uh, uh, um, talented sculptors. And this is just the maquette, but you can see the detail they got into, into this particular sculptor. And this is made of code. It's a sort of ceramic that you fire at a very, very high temperature and it makes it's very, very weather resistant. Code was used on, uh, devised by a lady called Eleanor Code in the 1780s. And it's used on a lot of the uh, really important buildings in, in London. And it's, you can get incredible detail on it and it's very, very uh, weather resistant. So it's perfect for this sort of uh, presentation. And you can see there's got wonderful movement in, 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 in that sculpture. At the back, we built a, a two for wall. Um, it's kind of quite a nice backdrop to a sculpture this kind of gnarly gray stone. And it's a two is a calcium carbonate. Uh, and it's a great uh, uh, for, 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 for plants to colonize in, but just takes a, a, a while. The ferns are only just starting to self sow. It's incredibly difficult to get these uh, adiantums to self sow and it does take time, but they're really uh, start, starting to find their way now, which is really exciting. It took me three years to find this two for stone. Um, I nearly ended up having to go to Italy. Uh, but anyway, found it quite locally in the end. Uh, and this is the, the cherry in the autumn. It really earns its keep. It's uh, a, a beautiful cherry. Also, I picked multi-stem trees uh, rather than standards. I think multi-stem trees look much prettier and more comfortable in a garden setting. Sometimes they can, sometimes uh, standards, you know, can look a bit kind of suburban and just uncomfortable in this style of garden, I think. So I'm gonna, uh, you know, uh, move on now and just, briefly look at the planting uh, that we do at Mulvleys and kind of quickly give you an overview of how we, you know, of what we do. A lot of these things, you know, like uh, that we're going to look at, like the tulips and, uh, and the self serves and things are kind of lectures in their own right, but it can still give you a, a, a taster of, of what we get up to. And this is another picture from, uh, uh, from the expedition. Um, and one of the things about here is, is, is the big leaves. Uh, they instantly give you that kind of exotic feel. And one of the things that we built at Mulvleys, again, one of the, it came from Dixter, the inspiration. I loved the exotic garden at Dixter. It was one of my favorite places. It's built for one season. It's built for late summer, but it's the exotic uh, foliage that sets the, sets the tone and gives it the, the exotic feel. And here you can see, this is a, a begonia luxuriance with uh, colocasias and cannas, and then there's cypress behind, there's dahlias and things. And this is, this is our, our take on, on, the, on the exotic garden at Mulvleys. Uh, and again, you can kind of see the bananas in the back, Musa Basju, the Rondo Donax, uh, various dahlias, and uh, there's lots of big foliage. There's Paulonias in there. There's, there's kind of uh, the uh, rice sinus, that's the rice paper plant, Cyp uh, not Cyprus, uh, Tetrapanix papyphora, and, and that sort of thing. And they all give it this wonderful exotic feel. You know, and, and the planting at uh, Mulvleys is quite diverse. Uh, and we, you know, we, we have this exotic on, but we don't plant exotics too far out of this garden. Like Dixter, they'll have a lot of cannas in the borders, but we tend to keep them just purely in, 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 into, into, into the exotic garden. I don't think I've shown you a picture of the white garden yet. Um, but anyway, here we are looking at the white garden and it just kind of demonstrates the, the sort of atmosphere that you can have by, you know, just changing planting styles. Uh, and I just want to, like I say, talk to you about the, the way we put these plants together. Um, 
obviously we have the shrubs that form the structure and the bones of the garden and then we have the perennials in amongst them uh, that gives you these 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 swathes of color and then to break up the perennials we have self serves and things like that running through them but we also embrace succession as well i mean this is one of the plantings from from the white garden or a piece of planting it kind of demonstrates how we might put something together quite well uh, and you can see you've got this uh, lovely nephophia this is Nephophia northii. It's, it would be too tender to use, obviously, in maybe Wave Hill and uh, in New York. Uh, but it's a, it's a wonderful plant from South Africa. Actually, has bright orange flowers, but we chop them off. We only want the foliage. But it's a lovely contrast to the the cornice that's behind it. This is uh, the, the variegated cornice, uh, cornice uh, uh, Alternifolia argentea, and then you know that has a kind of delicate sort of tiered effect, and then you have the uh, Hydrangea Annabelle, and then you have uh, Sorbus tibetanus. Oops, sorry. And then you have the uh, uh, Erica lusitanica, and they all have different textures. At the moment, this is the dominant. This is your kind of focal point. But if you if you blotted that out, maybe the Erica would stand out because that foliage is quite different. And then your eye will start to move around, as you know, because there's all of these different shapes and textures going on that that make. Make, and that we contrast against each other, make it uh, an, an interesting, interesting picture. And again, here you can see with perennials how we have the uh, um, the echinops there versus the, the round echinops versus the fat plates of the of the ami, and then you have the spikes of the uh, um, the, the willow herb, and then the, the silver foliage plumes of the of, of the willow, and then the spikiness of, of the sea holly. These are kind of if you got you know. If you had that in black and white, it would still be kind of quite an interesting thing to look at. And this is what we're always thinking when we're putting things together. We're always thinking about the shapes, the textures, you know, uh, uh, even how something might move. And so we might put maybe a grass next to something that's very, that's got lots of movement next to something that's very static, just because it makes it interesting to look at. And this is, you know, what we're about. Another thing that we use quite a lot at Mulvilles are conifers. Not too many, but we use them in the flower garden. They're a lovely contrast to other things around. And one of the things that they do is also they, they create quite a gentle link between the, the, the flower garden and, and what's going on beyond. Because we have a lot of conifers and pines and uh, uh, such like planted in, in and around the garden. And it's nice to create this conversation between what's going on in the garden and what's going on outside the garden. People can be a bit funny about conifers in the flower garden or in the garden generally. They think they're a bit suburban. But they're, they're not. I mean, they're one of the things that really doesn't like suburbia. They're just, you know, and you often find them in the wildest places, but they just get this kind of bad press because they've been badly used and overused. You wouldn't want too many conifers in the garden because it would kind of, it might look a bit too heavy. It might drag it into the 1980s. But you know, one or two can be really quite effective, particularly things like this. And this is a very rare pine. This is Pinus Bhutanica, comes from Aranutral Pradesh and that in Bhutan and that sort of area. Uh, it's a really wonderful five needle pine, creates a wonderful atmosphere. Um, and just a, a slight aside, you know, when we're thinking about plants and being careful about using plants, I mentioned grasses very briefly. Um, and this is uh, um, a, a, a morning light, uh, and it's a wonderful Calamagrostis. And we would only use one or two here and there to create a kind of contrast between other perennials and things. Having too many grasses for me kind of changes the atmosphere of a garden quite quickly and, and considerably. Um, you have to be careful how you use them unless you want a, a grass garden. I mean, you know, I do like the grass garden at Kew. It's a wonderful wonderful, wonderful garden. If I had space, I might have my own grass garden, but I wouldn't want too many of them in the flower garden. You, you, you've just got to be careful how you use certain plants. Uh, and again, what you can do in the, 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 the white garden, you can do in the hot garden. Again, you've got the, all the different shapes here, you know, the, 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 the foliage of the, uh, of the uh, crocosmia versus the plumes of the sambucus and of the, the different foliage on, on the flocks there. You know, you've got another conifer, you know, a pine pine, a sylvestris aurea. We try and put all of these shapes again, and it just creates this wonderful atmosphere. You see the bones of this garden, incredibly important for making this space work, you know. 
And again, a simple uh, uh, combination from the woodland garden. Uh, uh, it's a contrast here, but it's, it's, it's the thing about, I mean, and the reason I put this in, I mean, I'm slightly over egging the pudding, but I love the, the, this foliage and it goes on forever. This goes on for, for like nearly half a year. Uh, you have this virginia called uh, ciliata dumbo, massive great leaves, contrast with the flat heads of hydrangea claverin. And then you have the plumes of the, uh, of the dryopteris there. And it's just a simple combination. It's got legs and goes on forever, but it's uh, uh, also really, really, really effective. Moving on from talking about how we put plants together to looking at succession. Um, you want a garden to earn its keep. Um, you want it to, to, to go on for a while. And one of the things that we do, I mean, uh, as we do a lot of uh, succession planting, you have your su summer climax, and then we want to, it, the garden to, to, you know, to, to, to be looking good in the spring uh, and uh, also in the autumn, either side of, of that climax. Again, here you can see the importance of shrubs. If that garden didn't have shrubs, it would be incredibly flat. The thing about tulips is they tend to flower up at the same level. A lot of the vegetation that's coming through will also be just around the same level or just below the tulips. So it can look a bit monotonous. So by having shrubs, just, you know, you have these kind of woody interruptions. It just makes it a little bit more uh, uh, appealing. This is a lovely tulip called Black Hero. Um, we, a lot of the tulip plantings are, are, are fairly perennial at Mulvilly. This is perennial. We add to it every year. Uh, and it kind of, by adding tulips and having tulips that are perennial, it helps to break up that kind of flatness. So you get smaller tulips that flower at different height and uh, taller, obviously bigger tulips, the newer plants uh, are, are taller. And so we, you know, we'll plant these, weave these through the sleeping perennials. You know, it's, I often kind of use later tulips so we have more going on. I don't like tulips against bare soil. So if by picking the later varieties, you've got this kind of cloth of green beneath and then the, some of the annuals will be coming into play. And then as the tulips finish, we either deadhead them or just let them get consumed by the, the foliage. If you can see, this is the, um, the uh, uh, hemerocallis there. Uh, there's the hemerocallis and it just goes on. Uh, and there's the hemerocallis you know, building. And so there's a lot of adding and subtracting to keep the garden looking fresh and to keep it looking lively right the way through, through, through the year. And what you can do in the, on the main borders next to the house, you can do in the white garden with, with tulips. But of all the gardens, again, this is uh, uh, moving through, um, all the gardens, this is the most difficult to, to keep going into the autumn because it doesn't take many browns to spoil a white garden. It's like a white shirt, you know, you get a mark on it, it shows up straight away. It's the same with a white garden, you know, you know, more colorful shirt, you kind of, you know, you're not gonna, you're gonna miss the stains, but uh, in a white garden, you're not. And there's no amount of editing is gonna get rid of them all. So, you know, it does start to sort of fall apart come, come sort of August time. And so this is, uh, uh, again, the back to the terrace and, you know, again, similar sort of thing, just moving through the garden um, uh, through the year with a lot of uh, succession planting. And they're gonna finish off by talking about uh, self sows and a little bit about bedding, because this really sets the tone at Mulvilles. One of the things that uh, we try to do is we try to, 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 to make the garden look fairly natural. We have these sort of groups of perennials and the shrubs and things. You know, no matter how naturalistic we try and make those plantings look, you know, we might have these organic groups kind of melting into one another. Essentially, it's kind of constructed and it's man-made. So by introducing things like, you know, this, this uh, fennel in there that self sows, it kind of dilutes that kind of the hand of man and you kind of, it just makes it look more relaxed and more appealing and more dramatic, you know? And you can see this, there's lots of self sows going on here. Here we haven't got so many. Here we've got a huge amount on, on, on and it's, it's gardening on the edge here because you can almost kind of see it's going to kind of lose that structure. It's going to become a little bit messy, you know. And when you start to kind of look in, you've got oinotheras, you've got dianthus there, we've got uh, verbascums there, 
We've got a, a rigor on anus there. We've got the dioramas, all of these things. And there's many more in there as well. They're all self sewing They form this wonderful kind of tapestry effect. It's almost impressionistic when they start to come together and you get the light behind them. But it's very high maintenance. You've got to be on it the whole time. Otherwise, the verbascums will take over or something else will take over. So it's a lot of editing that goes on here to keep balance and to keep that naturalistic look. It looks like you've just forgotten about it, but it is actually... Uh, uh, very, very high maintenance. And one of the things as well about cell sows is a lot of these plants are kind of, you know, they're actually natives. Um, and by letting them loose in the garden in a considered kind of way, it creates a nice link, a, 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 you know, a bond between the garden and what's going on around it. You see here we have uh, the carrot, we have it in the gardens, uh, Dorcas carota, and also in the meadows. And it's just nice. You may not pick up on it consciously but subconsciously I think you know you see these things uh, and it just makes it look and feel more more comfortable and also you know self-sowers as well they're good for kind of stitching these big borders together they create this kind of they create rhythm uh, you know and here we have this kind of uh, verbascum running through and you just your eye catches it and runs through the border just naturally you know my friend Frank Ronan, he calls them the great yellow exclamation marks running through the border. And they're biennials and, you know, they run all over the place. They love it on the edge where there's a bit of stone, but they're, they're, they're just a, a, a great way of, of, of connecting uh, plantings. And what we've done in the hot garden, here we have in the house border as well, uh, you know, the vavascums running through these candelabras. And then we have the fennels running through as well. And it just softens it a bit and, and keeps it, you know, makes it kind of, uh, for me, more, more, more appealing and, and prettier. And the fennels in the self serves as well, they also work quite hard. You know, you don't have to plant these things. They find a way, you kind of edit them a bit and they can, you know, they can bring succession in, in, into planting. They can help you out. And the fennel, the bronze fennel is, is particularly good at that. So we can see we have that running right the way through the whole of this border and it creates a lovely feel and, uh, and foil for, for, for some of these later plantings. Here you can see it doing its thing, but you've got to be on it because sometimes the fennel can be very thick and bulky, particularly when it gets to this stage. And then we have to go through and kind of edit it a bit and cut out the stems and just thin it. But it can cope with that, you know, you work what you you work out what works best for you. And sometimes we just take a leaf out of the self sowers handbook, if you like, and we copy them. Uh, so we do a lot of interplanting. Um, and this is, you know, a corn cockle is a good example. When you're using self sowers or, or, or interplanting with bedding to replicate what self sowers do, you want to use things that are very delicate that aren't going to impose on the, their perennial neighbors. So here we have this kind of, uh, this wonderful little corn cockle. Uh, it's the slender corn cockle, has a bit, has larger flowers than the other one. We just thread it through, through the garden. This is the white form, uh, very, very pretty. You can see by threading it through, again, it kind of gives you an extra layer of interest when the perennials are only you know, starting to wake up. It's a good way of bridging that June gap, but it doesn't impose on the perennials. You know, The white one as well, is, if you want it kind of something a bit more punchy, it does show up better than, than the mauve version. And you, know, you can come up with these wonderful combinations as well. This is Pimpinella major rosia, uh, where we kind of thrown the, a, a few together. So I'm gonna kind of, I think I'm coming to the end now, but you know, when you kind of, when we got here, we didn't really have, you know, the borders were quite shallow, the, there weren't many borders. So we've had to build a lot of it from scratch. Um, and we kind of, you know, we've brought in lots of plants from all different nurseries to kind of get the combinations. And it's been a lot of trial and error along the way, but it kind of, I mean, this wouldn't happen kind of without, you know, uh, you know, the staff, there's five of us that put this garden to, that look after this garden. We also look after the animals as well. We're going to be lambing shortly, but the guys work really hard, you know, um, to, to achieve this sort of uh, uh, effect. They're really good, good gardeners. Um, so I just, you know, want to kind of say thanks to them as well. And, and, and you know, um, the effects that we've got is kind of, is, is pretty, um, pr pretty pleased with, because it's, you know, it, it has happened quite, quite quickly. Um, it is, you know, high maintenance, but it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, you know, you get what you put into a garden. Um, I'm coming to the end. So 
if anyone has any questions, uh, do, do let me know. Um, thank you very much. And I hope you enjoyed the talk and you're still awake and you're still there because I can't see you. <laughs> Hello. Matt, this is yes. I just wanted to say thank you so much. And um, I would like to invite all of our attendees to please join in on these polls before we go to the Q&A. So it seems the results from the first poll are in. If everyone cannot see them, the question was, what are you excited about having in your gardens? If we can have the second poll, please. Question is, how old were you when you started gardening? Thirty-nine percent of our participants today were less than ten years old when they started gardening. Wow. We are now going to move over to the Q and A, Matt, and Louis will be asking you the questions on behalf of many of our pan, um, attendees. So, if you just hold one second. Thank you, Matt. Hello. What a wonderful talk. What a beautiful garden. Lots of questions came in. And near the end of your talk, you answered one that came up several times, and that is how many gardeners. But maybe you could elaborate a little on how those five gardeners work. Do they live there? Are they year round? That sort of thing? Um, yeah, uh, we're there year round. Um, and we, you know, um, I suppose we kind of gardening full time throughout the year. We don't have the the kind of the frosts that maybe you guys have uh, that stop us keep us out of the garden. Um, but shortly we will we do quite a lot of work with the animals and we will be lambing quite soon. So um, that will take us out of the garden for a week or two. You know, but you know, there's always someone in the garden. Um, but you know, it's, um, at this time of year. We'll be going through the garden, editing, planting lots of corn cockles and all layers and ammies and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, but it's quite wet as well. So five people go a long way when you're gardening year round, I suppose, is part of the answer. Yeah, five people go a long way. Um, it's but it's they work incredibly hard and um, yeah, it's it's kept quite we're kept quite busy. One of the first questions to come in was about how deep you made the border when you doubled it, that long border with the Yorkstone path. How deep? Um, I'd say it's about five meters deep, give or take. Um, yeah. Quite deep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have deep 
uh, borders that are much deeper, but uh, that particular one. We don't have as many shrubs and in that Abby one. And Abby Zabar asked whether you use more than one kind of yew in your yew hedging um, topiary. Normally it's just straight Taxus baccata. We, we have used uh, Taxus cross media uh, before in the white, well, we've got that in the white garden. Do you have other animals beside the sheep and chickens? Yeah. Uh, yeah, we have uh, 20 plus head of cows. We have um, 25 deer. Um, we have, uh, well, we've got about 50, well, we've got about 60 sheep at the moment, but they're all going to have lambs. So that will, will double. Um, yeah, and swans. We've got swans, trumpeters and hoopers. Um, yeah, the deer are the easiest ones. And another question about varieties that you grow. Do you, do you have some idea how many kinds of flowers you grow for cutting? Oh, uh, no, it changes every year as well. Um, I mean, we do, I mean, we cut, we have a cutting border, but we also cut from the garden. So it's kind of, um, you know, it's, 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 it's a very kind of dynamic kind of entity, if you like, but we are building a market garden across the road. Um, so we will have more cut flowers and more vegetables and things like that um, in the future. And we have a couple of nuts and bolts kind of questions. One is a question about how quickly it appears your gardens establish themselves. And do you have some advice about, about how to accomplish that that might be useful to us? Um, yeah, the, the most important thing is to look after your soil particularly when you're doing these large projects. Um, your topsoil is something to, it's, it's to cherish. It's the lifeblood of everything you're going to do in the future. Um, inevitably, there's going to be a bit of kind of, when you move soil away and you're kind of changing levels with the, the subsoil and then you move it back, it kind of sits a bit like porridge for a, a couple of years. But it's, uh, it's always better to kind of work with it, incorporate lots of compost, and never be too tempted to be bringing soil out and bringing soil in. It's much better to have soil that's kind of grown up with the subsoil beneath it. If you know, there'll be there's a better relationship there. Um, uh, so, so I mean, I think that that's that's really, really, really important. Um, and to make sure that you pick the right plants, pick plants that work with your soil and with your surroundings, because they're just going to do so much better. It's, it's, it's not worth kind of the certain things, obviously your treasures that you're going to fight for. Um, um, but there's some things that just, you know, generally trying to work with what you've got, you know, work with the soil that you've got. Sound advice. Um, Matt, Sarah, I actually had a question from one of our um, attendees asking that in the last few slides, there were gorgeous long spine plants with pinkish reddish hanging blooms cascading over the walk and she would like to know what they are. Uh, they're, they're dioramas. They're, that's your angel's fishing rods. Um, we have some quite nice varieties. One of them, we have uh, one of the best is, not the best, the nicest is Puck, uh, diorama Puck. Um, you know, one of the sleeve Donut hybrids. I got that one from Michael Wickenden. Uh, from Cali Gardens when he was alive. Uh, and it's a great one for, it will actually split vegetatively. A lot of dioramas are kind of quite fussy about being moved, but this one um, is, is very good. But diorama, Paul Kerriman is generally what we have. Matt, another question from Donna Rafferty. Is there another major project on the horizon at Mall Release? And will you have time to travel? If so, where would you go? Uh, Say that again, the last bit, uh, the first bit. Where would I travel? If I went on an expedition, was that it or? Correct. Yeah. Um, well, uh, there's a couple of places that, I mean, I would love to go to North Korea. It's slightly controversial, I know, but good <laughs> plants, hardy, uh, hasn't been explored. Or I would go back to Northeastern uh, Arunachal Pradesh uh, or northern Burma and Myanmar, that sort of region. You basically, if you follow the Himalayas, where they kind of peter out into, into Myanmar, that area is really remote, difficult to get to. Um, and I'd love to go back there. 
and to explore that some more. Um, yeah, definitely. Thank you, Matt. Louis, did you have any more questions? Well, I have one question. Uh, I wondered whether the cantilevered rill idea was something you'd seen at another garden. Is uh, I hadn't heard about it, that kind of construction before. It was. Um, did you invent it? Uh, yeah, I invented it. No, um, it's 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 kind of uh, there's the Alhambra, uh, the the series of of uh, fountains uh, in Granada, uh, but it was kind of a take on that, and maybe um, a rail that I'd seen a Lutchins rail, and you know, and just kind of an amalgamation of various ideas, um, and it just seemed to kind of work. Um, when we first put that in, incidentally, the the um, the nozzles that we used on the fountains were much thicker and that was to stop the water from moving in the wind but the noise it made was deafening you know it kind of monopolized the whole garden it completely defeated the object of the, of the enterprise so we had to take all the nozzles off and this is the thing about water it's a very dynamic thing it's you, you really don't know what's going to happen and so then we had to change and reduce the nozzles they're much finer but they do move around in the in the wind a bit um so we have to top it up every now and then but it's uh um, it works really nicely. It's very pretty, and particularly when you get all of the, the confetti flowers in there and things like that. And I think I have one last question. How old were you when you started gardening? How old was I? Um, gosh. Um, my grandma um, was quite... Um, my grandma, who's uh, alive, she's 98, um, and just had... Uh, she also had COVID, and um, it, she did, it didn't touch her because she's from Yorkshire. Um, she, she got me into gardening. Uh, she used to take me to the Alpine Garden Society um, uh, lectures when I was uh, very young. And I can remember going, yeah, uh, that, that was kind of, she was instrumental. She was a great gardener, founder of the Friend of Nest Gardens as well. Um, she was one of the, the first people involved in that. So, um, yeah, but my parents are also into it as well. But I think my grandma. So clearly in your blood. This was a yeah. wonderful talk. Thank you very much, Matt. It's a pleasure, absolute pleasure. Thanks for having me.